Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. How you doing this weekend? What's what's fascinating out there? James, this is October, and October is Cancer Awareness Month, and there's some good news on that front. Since the 1990s, deaths from breast cancer have dropped 40%, and deaths from cancer in general have dropped 25%. That's actually pretty good. That is good news. And continuing with the good news, an interesting thing, conventional wisdom, you know, we hear this frequently, says that uh, government, we need government to help the needy because people are too selfish to help voluntarily. And yet somehow, you know, every time there's a disaster, people prove the conventional wisdom wrong. A couple of examples. Uh, Steve Sisolek of Las Vegas started a GoFundMe to help the victims of the Las Vegas massacre. In five days, he has raised $10 million in private donations. Uh, Uber in the same town is giving free rides to people uh, to and from blood donation centers. And uh, not to be forgotten, amongst other tragedies uh, in Puerto Rico, celebrity chef uh, Jose Andres is cooked and delivered 45,000 meals for hurricane survivors, again, on, all on his own and his donor's dimes. Well, on, on my side of the interesting world, we go from the ill-advised to the patently absurd. So maybe I'll balance you off in some sort of way. Beginning with our president, leader, big toe, Donald Trump. Who, who is out there right now starting to demand what he calls equal time um, in order to counteract the, uh, the drubbing he's taking on late night talk shows. He, this is really the same sort of thinking, though, that gave us the patently unconstitutional fairness doctrine, which was in place from 1949 to 1987. He's using the phrase equal time to get us to think about the, the, the regulation that applies during campaign season to candidates. But really, that's not what he's after here. And I think it's pretty clear why he's doing this, um, in addition to getting just pasted on the late night talk shows. A recent Pew Research study concluded that coverage of Trump is the most negative in 25 years of a president similarly situated in time. Of, of any president in 25 years? In 25 years, yeah. He's gotten about 5% positive coverage, 62% negative, with the balance being, you know, s somewhere in the neutral middle. So from there, we move on to an even worse idea, I think, and that's McDonald's offering up the McVegan. Um, thankfully, this is only available in Finland, and it's a soy patty topped with vegetables and mcfeast sauce whatever in god's name mcfeast sauce is and I, I think the real question here is will this actually taste more like a hamburger than mcdonald's regular fare uh i anxiously await the reports from finland yeah i would i expect when i go to buy a hamburger that i'm actually getting well i mean a hamburger right yeah, yeah. Um, at mcdonald's you're probably coming up short twice over at this point. Um, but but we let that slide because even that isn't the foolishness of the week. The foolishness of the week this week comes to us courtesy of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, the, the good people who work there demanded this week that a Massachusetts bakery fix its ingredients listings. Because? Well, the Neshoba Brook Bakery had the audacity to list love as one of their ingredients in, <laughs> in their granola. And the FDA lost its mind. <laughs> and the FDA lost its mind. The FDA said love is not a common or usual name of an ingredient and must be removed. <laughs> and I think proving that humor is not a common or usual element of FDA regulation. Well, no one knows what the salt content is of love. That's right. Is love gluten-free? I don't know. What about the carb content? Ah. Uh, so many questions, so little time. But from there, we, from from foolishness, we move on to something that I think is is probably quite a lot more dangerous, and that's rank hypocrisy, right? It's nothing new in politics. It's always pretty to easy, pretty easy to see it in individuals. But we got here most recently from Representative Tim Murphy, a Republican in the House from Pennsylvania, of all places. Uh, you're probably partially responsible for this. He's my district representative, believe it or not. Well, not for much longer, because he, he will be resigning um, in, in a, a, a cloud of shame, as often happens with these things. Um, Tim Murphy encouraged 
his mistress, which is probably already a problem of some kind, right? Because Mrs. Murphy is probably going to have something to say about this down the road. But he encouraged his mistress to get an abortion during a recent pregnancy scare, which, you know, abortion being legal and all might not be such a big deal had Tim Murphy not been such an outspoken advocate for, for tightening up abortion regulations. So... You know, he's probably got himself more of a problem here than he can ever hope to overcome. Uh, all kinds of other horrible things have emerged about his character or lack thereof. But but he's on his way out now. And this sort of thing is a lot more common than any of us would like. And it certainly crosses all, all party boundaries, right? There's Neither party has a a monopoly on this sort of thing. And, and the, the mind goes immediately to Leland Yee who was a pretty vocal advocate for gun control during his time in the California legislature, um, he was ultimately arrested. Why do you think he might have been arrested, Ant? Oh, I know this. I know the story. <laughs> I know exactly why he was arrested. That's right. It was gun trafficking, um, specif specifically buying guns from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which has one of the most unfortunate acronyms in the history of acronyms. I'll leave you to work it out. But it's not, it's not just guns. No, 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 that's right. It's not just guns. It was automatic weapons and shoulder-launched missiles. Uh, and he, he was a bit of an arbitrageur. He was buying the guns from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and then trying to turn around and sell them at a profit to, sadly for him, what turned out to be undercover FBI agents. But, you know, if we could switch back to the Republicans again, we've got Larry Craig, former Republican senator from Idaho, um, he had a long standing history of supporting, you know, what anybody might call anti gay legislation, but was caught engaging in lewd conduct in the men's room of the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. Uh, all kinds of terrible hypocrisy. There's just never any shortage of this sort of thing. Yeah, it's the do, do as I say, not as I do crowd. Right. And, and none of us tend to be all that surprised by any of it, but we do get angry over it. And I think, you know, rightfully so. Hypocrisy is is a bad thing. And when we see it in our political leaders, we take umbrage. But these examples, I think, should have us thinking a lot more broadly about the idea of hypocrisy in American politics, because as guilty as all of these men are, and, and they were, and I mean, we probably have lots more examples, right? Oh, there, there, there are tons of examples, right? Um, I've got uh, in, in part of it, a large part of it, I think, comes down to, to the voters. And there's a here's an example that, that actually involves them. Uh, when George W. Bush was president, uh, polls indicated that 61 percent of Democrat voters said that NSA surveillance of cell phones was completely unacceptable. That's understandable. But fast forward to when Barack Obama is president and you've got 64 percent of Democrat voters saying that phone surveillance is OK. So apparently sur uh, surveil NSA surveillance of your telephone is uh, is OK, depending on which party's in, in power. And that's not uh, that's not just a sin of the Democrats. Repo polls with Republicans showed the same thing. When Bush was president, Republicans were for NSA surveillance of cell phones by three to one. But when Obama becomes president, they drop to being evenly split. So you've got uh, voters on both sides of the aisle uh, happy for government overreach, provided that the guy that, that they want in office is sitting in the White House. Right. And, you know, it seems to be the case that what we think of as being, quote unquote, right, broadly speaking, seems somehow attached to who holds all the power. Right. And you know, the example that I keep coming back to, I mean, over and over again, is the, the anti-war sentiment under Bush, George W. and Obama. Right. And how radically different um, partisans behaved in terms of their reaction to war and warlike events, depending on who was in power. Eight years of criticism of George W. Bush just seemed to melt away. The minute Obama took office, and you'll remember he was even given the Nobel Peace Prize about 20 minutes after he walked into the office, right? But it never actually returned. Where did the anti-war left go? Um, and, and think about this for a second. Obama actually bombed more countries than George W. Bush did. He attacked more Muslim countries than George W. Bush did. And drone strikes much, much higher under uh, Obama than they were under Bush. 
and yet he faced almost no criticism from his own people, the people who had put him into the office. It was a little bit at first, and it just kind of dissipated over time. And, you know, it goes, it gets a little worse than that, too, I think, because there were people on the left who rightfully, I think, criticized George W. Bush as being an autocrat during his eight years in, in office, right, that he took far too much power to the presidency. Yeah, they were quite right about that. I, th- I think that's right, but they were nowhere to be found once Obama increased presidential power. And now that the presidency has changed hands yet again, we're getting a lot more of this same sort of thing. And this is actually, it, it is scary because it indicates that people actually aren't concerned with an overly powerful president. They're just concerned with an overly powerful president who doesn't agree with things that they believe that other people should agree with. Right. And I think it goes even further than that, right? Because they'll change what they believe depending on who sits in the office over time. And that's the part that I just can't get my head around when it comes right down to it, because it starts to look for all the world like people have all but abandoned principle in a quest for power simply, right? That power has become the real thing here. They don't really care about principles at all. So where did the anti-war left go? They went into hibernation until a Republican got the presidency back. Well, a a good example of this, uh, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, when President Obama was in office, Johnson accused Obama of exceeding his authority by signing executive orders, uh, giving uh, temporary uh, legal status to, to illegal immigrants. Now, that same Senator Johnson turns around and most recently applauds President Trump for signing an executive order to begin constructing a wall to keep out illegal immigrants. And it's the same thing. There is no, there's, no, there's no driving principle here. It's simply a question of, is the guy in power doing what I want? And I, I think with the Trump administration, there's an even more blatant example sitting right front and center. And it gets to something that you and I talk about quite a lot, and that's the, the federal deficit and how that deficit piles up year over year and increases the debt. You, you want to run through those numbers in three easy seconds? Sure. When uh, when Trump was running for office, he claimed that he was going to cut the uh, our $20 trillion debt to zero over whatever it was, you know, four, eight years or some ungodly thing. And uh, now that he's in office, of course, all we hear about is that deficit spending is actually good for the economy. Yeah, but it gets it gets so much worse, right? Because when you step back and really take a look at what's transpired and who's said what, we we get President Trump's budget chief, Mick Mulvaney, a, a former congressman. And when he was in Congress, what was he? A massive deficit hawk went on and on and on as a congressman about how uh, Barack Obama's profligate spending was going to be the ruin of these United States. I don't think he's wrong about that. But now, now that he's the budget chief in the Trump White House, he thinks he was wrong about that because he's changed his tune completely. Um, When Obama was doing the spending, it was the worst thing in the world. But now, Here's the exact quote. We need to have deficits, he says. Why? To spur growth. So he went from a deficit hawk to a card-carrying Keynesian, and the intervening factor, the only intervening factor, was a change of power at the presidential level. Yeah. Right. That was it. There's absolutely no reason for his flip-flop on this, apart from his guys in office now, And we're going to toe the party line and say what we need to say in order to keep and maintain power over time. And, you know, I'm going to ask a basic question that I've been asking about politicians since I was a child. But now I'm going to ask it about almost everyone in these United States. And I want to know if anyone actually believes anything anymore. Yeah, well, I I think we fall into the habit somehow of thinking about outcomes rather than principles. So we imagine all the things that we want or that we don't want rather than asking what is right or what is not right. And so we end up in the end, many of us espousing, uh, you know, calling for things that are mutually exclusive or mutually contradictory. Right. And it it seems to me that where we sit right now, um, surveying the landscape of these things, what, what we're up against is a difference on the one hand. Well, no, I think just a simple difference between uh, raw partisanship and ideology, right? 
it, ideology or, or ideologue, I mean, this was a pejorative that got tossed around for years and years and years. There was nothing worse um, to call someone than an ideologue. Well, I think you, you and I get called it frequently in our hate mail. We do, and I, I do enjoy the hate mail, so please keep it coming. Um, but but here's the weird part. I cheerfully admit to being an ideologue. It, it's, a, it's a title I wear with a certain amount of pride, right? Because an ideologue believes in something. There's an overarching belief in a thing. And, and for me, that thing is the goodness of human freedom. I believe that that people should be as free as is possible within the confines of a decent regime. That's what I believe. That is my ideology. Now, from there, I draw all manner of conclusions. And and as a result of those conclusions, I will sometimes be in favor and sometimes be against things that politicians are trying to accomplish. But but notice, it's always through the lens of something I view to be a first principle. Yes. And I think that's the important thing. When when people throw about the term ideologue, they're using it incorrectly. They're describing conclusions, not principles. So you're you're not an ideologue if you believe that you have a, uh, the right to keep guns. You're an ideologue if you believe in, in the principle of self-ownership, if you believe that you have a right to to uh, to defend yourself, to engage in commerce with others. And then there are things that follow from that as conclusions. Yeah, that that's right. And on, on some level, there's literally no difference between me, say, and a communist. We're both ideologues. We just begin with radically different ideologies. And the conclusions that flow from those ideologies are, in, in fact, radically different, as well we would expect them to be. Um, but this is different. It's not mutually exclusive, of course, but it's different from partisans. And I think what we're viewing now is a total absence of ideology. There's no overarching first principle that anyone appeals to anymore. Really, what they appeal to is the idea of electoral victory. It's important, they believe, that their party, whichever one it happens to be, win. Right. It's become sports teams. That's right. But there's no ultimate reason why they believe their team should win, except screw those other guys. And that's not really much of a reason. The, the two teams are, are now um, uh, giving us pretty much the same outcomes, right? We have the same deficits, regardless of which team's in office. We have the same wars, regardless of which teams are in office. Not much changes. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think we have to start asking some pretty difficult questions, right? Because... On the one hand, it's all fun and games when we're going after politicians from either party who engage in rank hypocrisy on the public stage. But it's quite another when we turn the attention back to ourselves, the people, and we see very similar things going on with us. Right? Because it seems to be the case that the longer we go, the more important it becomes that we win and the less important it is that we do the right thing, whatever that might happen to be. And I, I think as, as a way of starting to address this, I, I saw, uh, I think it was from Pew again, just last week. It was reported on CNN. That's where I saw it. They have great stuff. They do. It's really interesting. But I saw the CNN report. I haven't dug into the, the initial study all that much yet, but I plan on doing that this week. Um, but it indicated that, Amer the American people, as divided as we now find ourselves, um, Republicans have very few, if any, Democrat friends. Democrats have very few, if any, Republican friends. And it's, co it's, come to the it's come to the point where we're actually not speaking to each other. And that seems to be part and parcel of this entire problem. Right? If we really could take a step back and say, what's going on here? I think what's going on here is that we're not talking to each other anymore because we, we have ceased to, to realize that those people we disagree with are our fellow citizens. Yeah. In, instead, we now browbeat each other. What's really going on here? Are we all hypocrites at the most fundamental of levels? Well, I think in, in, in a large sense, we don't we don't think things through. Right. We again, we look to to our to the conclusions, ignoring the principles. So we'll say things like, for example, we should have a progressive tax system. OK, fine. But then when we cut taxes across the board, we get all bent out of shape because they're tax cuts for the rich. But if you have a progressive tax system, 
Every tax cut is a tax cut for the rich. It's part of having a progressive tax system. And, and so again, we're, we're presented with these, with these apparent contradictions because people start at the end rather than the beginning. They start at conclusion rather than principle. So is there an answer? I mean, is there a way to fix this? Because I'm starting to think maybe there's not the more I look at how people actually behave and perceive one another. Well, I think we should only use government when we're in agreement as to what government should be doing where only half of us think a particular thing's a good idea, then government probably isn't the right tool for achieving that thing. It's for this reason that our government was designed with checks and balances. It's supposed to be difficult to pass laws. The difficulty assures that only laws with widespread support will be enacted. But the harder it is to pass laws, the less power politicians wield. So to bolster their power, the politicians have come to replace our laws with regulations and executive orders. These tools are, are not as clearly subject to checks and balances as, as laws are. And, and as we move from a nation of laws to a nation of regulations and executive orders, we've, we've somehow lost the need to compromise. Instead, we now browbeat. Democrats get elected. They use regulations and executive orders to impose their will in the country. Then four or eight years later, Republicans get elected and they do the same thing. In the end, it, it seems that we've lost our desire for democracy. In its place, we've substituted a sequence of four to eight year dictatorships. Uh, the key, I think, to reclaiming our democracy is to look at our neighbors not as members of the opposing party, uh, but as fellow citizens. You mean as our neighbors? As neighbors. <laughs> that's, a, that's a crazy thought right there. <laughs> crazy thought. But I, I, it's hard to see how anything serves as a better final word than that. So on that happy note, we'll, we'll call it a week and we'll see you next Wednesday at about noon here on Words and Numbers. Until then, be sure to stop by fee.org and at fee online for all kinds of great content. And be sure too to join us at the Words and Numbers Backstage Facebook group where we take this conversation every week and continue it along. So if you want to have your say and, you know, maybe in lieu of hate mail, you can join us there and call us ideologues and tell us in real time of all of our defects. Come on by there and, and we'd be happy to have you. So until then and on the Backstage Facebook group, and I'll see you there. Have a good week. See you next week, James.